All right. Uh, thanks for joining us for our final panel today uh, during the Auto Tech Showcase. Um, we have spent the afternoon talking about the safety technology that is available today um, and the digitally enabled safety technology that is already beginning to make its way into vehicles. Uh, but we are going to wrap things up by talking about automation and artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies that have an opportunity to reimagine automotive safety as we know it today. Uh, to help me do this, we've assembled an incredible group of panelists. Thanks for being here. Uh, we've got Vin White, Senior Advisor at the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and also Acting Chief AI Officer at the Department of Transportation, and also the uh, <laughs> designated federal official on the department's Transforming Transportation Advisory Committee. We've got Tara Andringa, Executive Director of PAVE, the Partners for Automated Vehicle Education. Michelle Gattuso, Vice President of Product Management at Harman. And last but not least, Andrew Bates, Senior Manager of the ADAS product line at Magna. So Vin, Tara, Michelle, Andrew, thank you so much uh, for being here. So let's jump right in. Uh, each of you, your organizations, are doing some pretty important work in the automation and AI space. Um, so for the benefit of our audience, let's just go down the line, have each of you share a little bit about what it is that you are currently working on in this space. And Ben, if we could start with you, that'd be great. Sure, thank you, Hillary. And, and my thanks for uh, the warm welcome here. Uh, it's great to be with this group of panelists. I'm kind of jealous I'm kind of on, not on this side of this little table. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Vin White, I'm with DOT and I wear many hats, uh, as Hillary mentioned. Um, it, they're all very exciting. Uh, I think that there are a number that I could just drill on all day. And I am going to sort of assume that you know the usual suspects that are happening at the department. Um, one area to just drill on is the area of artificial intelligence. Um, I serve as the acting chief AI officer uh, this is a role that was established under an executive order uh, by the president, uh, requiring all agencies to have a person like me on the other side to help uh, set up protocols, governance, compliance methods for evaluating and deploying uh, both enterprise and sector-facing forms of AI. Uh, and so having that structure in place is, you know, it's not flashy. But at this stage, it's so early in the process of how this is coming to government, um, it's a great opportunity. So right now, we are uh, surveying industry. We're looking internally at special projects. Um, our secretary, uh, his voice, he likes to amplify and elevate his voice and use it for this purpose. Uh, so right now, uh, the sky's the limit. And to be honest, I feel like all government agencies had this starting then go off in this area, some doing it longer than others. And so now DOT, we get to get further into the game and we've got our running shoes on or we're running downfield and it's all open space. Uh, one thing that they focus on uh, primarily is, you know, what are, the, what are the benefits? Obviously, there's a lot that you've seen in the news and what agencies are doing, companies are doing, uh, but how do you mitigate the, the bad risks that are out there when it comes to adopting this, right? So just to give an example, we have quite a process in place just to use something like ChatGPT, right? Something that almost feels ubiquitous at this stage. Right. Um, and so that just gives you a demonstration and a flavor of what's happening on the AI side at DOT. Fantastic, Tara. So I am with Partners for Automated Vehicle Education, or PAVE, and the, the hurdle to um, adopt, <laughs> uh, you know, um, really deploying the technology that we're working on is, is the, you know, piece of public education. And kind of the idea behind PAVE is that we are making huge progress with AV technology, but when you contrast that to public opinion polls, there's this huge chasm that largely what you see is people don't understand it, people don't trust it, say I would never get in one, and we believe that we'll never reach the potential of the technology if we don't have the public on board. Um, kind of to answer Hillary's question in a more granular way about what we're working on now, just one project I really want to mention because it's a big project that we're doing with um, Auto Innovators, is we see that one of the big safety hurdles we have right now is people not understanding the role of the driver in the vehicle. And as, you know, ADAS technology has become more and more sophisticated and can handle more of the driving task, there's confusion. And you hear people um, really not understanding that any car you buy today, you are in control. And so we are working on a public service announcement to really focus on 
um, the driver role and to help educate folks about um, how to safely use ADAS technology. Yeah, so more to come on that. Stay tuned. <laughs> Michelle, what's, what's Harman working on in this space? Hi, I'm Michelle Gattuso. I am VP of Product Management within Auto, um, Harman Automotive. Uh, we're primarily known for bringing entertainment into vehicles, but we also bring inf information, and that information is presented for safety-related features about keeping not only the driver safe, the passenger safe, but also pedestrians around safe. And so a lot of our technologies within the car are gonna be in that cockpit and on all the screens that you can see. So we believe we're bringing sight without seeing. Great, and Andrew. Yeah, uh, Andrew Bates from Magna. Um, so we're using automation and, and AI really to optimize the development of ADAS systems. So as I touched on earlier, one of the big benefits of AI is the ability to take in large sets of data and learn and train models based on that. So we're using that to increase the develop or reduce the development time of ADAS systems and doing them in a more cost-effective manner, and also use like low-level fusion to use a larger amount of the data that comes in instead of just object-oriented data sets. So. That's incredible. So we just talked about what you're all working on. I want to talk about the why for a second, and, and I want to start with the theme of today's showcase, which is safety. Do you agree that these emerging technologies, automation, AI, have an opportunity uh, to improve roadway safety? And, and if so, maybe what is the, the greatest benefit in your, in your mind on sort of the safety side? Maybe we can go in reverse order this time, shake things up and start with Andrew. Yeah, so the, I mean, coming back to, so AI, again, you are able to take in larger amounts of data to improve the robustness of your kind of classification systems and ADAS decision making. So instead of using kind of rule-based um, methodology, you can kind of use examples of like th real life behavior to make the ADAS system behave better like a human driver. And this will help with the adoption um, of users, right? If the, if the vehicle's driving in a behavior that's similar to how I drive, it's gonna be much easier to accept that. And I think this will give better adoption to ADAS systems and more, um, I guess, willingness for people to adopt them. Perfect, Michelle? I love this question because I know in technology, we focus a lot on the how, but wondering the why and why we're all working for this better cause is important. I think I'm getting feedback. Um, a couple of statistics that we find important for Harman. 100,000 crashes per year on average in vehicles. And of those in 2022, 290,000 injuries simply because it's a distracted driver. So I think in our mind, everyone jumps to a conclusion, but distracted driver can min mean many things. The 100,000 injuries was because someone was um, tired at the wheel and perhaps not alert, um, either causing uh, injuries to themselves, to other cars or other passengers. So really understanding um, all the technologies that we can solve those pain points and put into vehicles to not only um, save the lives within the vehicles, but everybody else around them too is super important for us. Thank you for that. Tara. And I would really echo that, you know, distraction and speeding and driving under the influence of the leading contributing causes of crashes and technology doesn't speed unless you, <laughs> to, to, you know, set it to, it doesn't drive, text and drive, it doesn't drink and drive. Um, and we have the ability to, you know, really implement life-saving technologies. Yeah. Great. So Vin, what about from the department? How are you thinking about this in terms of safety? Uh, you know, I'm going to be channeling our secretary here, so you've probably heard all this before. Um, it absolutely is both autonomy and AI to power that, uh, a tool in the toolbox. Uh, we see it as a future force, right? Um, but it has to be done right. And, you know, several years ago, secretary put out his innovation principles that, you know, we've seen time and again. But, you know, it really does lay out the framework for how we want to see technology just across the boards deployed, how we want to foster technology, right? We don't want to do technology for the sake of it. Um, we want to do it uh, out of purpose. And that purpose has to drive our policy uh, priorities. And so we can't keep that lens at the front and center uh, through all of these types of considerations. Uh, you know, me, from a personal perspective, uh, my son turns five in a few weeks. And, you know, I think about him and I, I know a few of you in the audience personally with young children, thinking about, right, for me, it's like a race against the clock to try and make it safer, make the system safer, because I know one day he's gonna get into that vehicle, whether or not he's driving, or even today, 
it's the other driver. He's not driving, but it's the other driver. And so those are the things that we keep kind of in the back of our minds as we, as we go about this work. Yeah, I, as a mother who just unleashed her teenage son uh, into the driving community, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, I yeah. feel for you. It's, yeah. it's, it's. Can, it's, can it's I make one last point though? Yeah, please. Of um, and that is, you know, uh, whether or not it's popular to say this, uh, we know that there has been a trajectory when it comes to safety, right? We've all seen this trend line that kind of goes like this from like the late '90s, right? right? And then all of a sudden, around 2010, it just kind of goes like this, and then with COVID, it kind of goes like that. And I think we all understand. Tara, you brought up distraction, right? But it's a host of it's aggressive driving, it's speeding, it's uh, under the influence, right? All these things. Um, but that technology introduction of the smartphone, right? You can't help but think about it. When you pull up to the light next to you and you see everybody around you, including the person walking in the crosswalk is on their phone. Um, and, and, you know, I slip and it happens sometimes. Uh, but, you know, what I see this technology as, as a real kind of like combating technology versus technology in this case, right? If we can deploy it fast enough and we can prove it out that it is safe, um, that might be a transformational game changer when it comes to, right, meeting this, bending this curve back down. For sure. No, I love that. So we've just talked about safety, and obviously I think we would all agree that is sort of priority number one, but there are also other benefits, I think, to this technology beyond safety. And so I just want to just throw it out there and see if anyone wants to offer, you know, some other ways we should also be thinking about automation and AI and what benefits it can bring to society. So jump ball on this one, grab it if you want it. Um, does anyone have any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think kind of commented that AI brings the ability to reduce the development time. So you can see the introduction of new and exciting technologies much yeah. quicker. Um, and De development can be handled more in an iterative approach. So things can be continually improved as you optimize the data set for what's relevant, because it's very good, as I said, of taking a large amount of data and, and providing the valuable outputs. Yeah, in all different environments. Like we, we live in a luxury of the US, but throughout the globe, each environment is a little bit different. And how do we optimize the algorithms? Um, either it's for driving patterns, it's for size of vehicles, it's for roads. Um, that varies by region. So having the, the bigger data miles um, allows us to go faster, but it also allows it to go globally and adapt as well. And I will give a much less um, techie answer, but <laughs> <laughs> the non-engineer here. Um, you know, both, I would want to kind of combine mobility and equity. Our, our transportation sir, current system doesn't serve a lot of people well. Yeah. And when you look at, you know, 18.6 million Americans who have self-reported travel-limiting disabilities. And, you know, the idea that technology could, 6% um, of our population could offer these people new ways to get to work, to medical appointments, to um, see family. And, and then similarly, you know, we have a lot of folks who um, live in food deserts or, um, you know, or, or, you know, have other, you know, um, <laughs> I think this, this technology can create greater equity in our transportation system that doesn't exist now. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just add from a government perspective, you know, we're looking at this both internally, kind of what we call enterprise, yeah. right? How does it enhance? How does it create efficiencies? Um, has it even checked our homework to a degree? Uh, you know, I think it was within the last few years, I was just reading up on a rule that we were doing. It received 15,600 comments. <laughs> um, and, you know, to your point, data, Right? How do you aggregate that data? How do you start to, you know, we came from a very manual process for analyzing that information. Um, you know, can we leverage the technology on the AI side to make that, kind of automate that process, yeah. right? So it's not vehicles, I understand. Wow. But, you know, when it comes to accelerating, right, a determination for a rule that matters to the industry, That's it. like that is a huge piece that can just be reduced potentially and then we can take those individuals and actually put them on different parts of a process, yeah. right? Um, more external facing, uh, we have a Complete Streets AI uh, initiative underway right now through our SPIR, our Small Business Innovation Research Program, that um, is, is inviting ideas for ways to leverage uh, artificial intelligence to analyze using geolocation and satellite and mapping, uh, how to plan our streets better. We've got an enormous opportunity around the infrastructure law, right? Uh, over trillion, trillion dollars here, right? Are we gonna keep doing things the same way that we have in the past? 
can we take a sort of a bird's eye view of analyzing how, you know, the right way to do these things, what it looks like, and then apply that for future planning. Perfect. So I've got a question for Andrew and Michelle. So in our, in our last panel, we were talking about V to X technology. Mm -hmm. And I want to see, I just want to ask you, do you, are you all viewing V to X technology as a discrete technology? Or is there some connection or interplay between things like V to X and the digital space and what we're talking about here on this panel, automation and AI? So, I mean, Andrew, maybe you can start. Do you see these as complementary? Yeah, I was very excited to hear all of the kind of push and adoption kind of momentum that V2X is getting because we see this as a way to kind of open up kind of the sensor horizon of existing sensor sets. So imagine now you, you know, today ADAS systems leverage the camera, radar, and ultrasonics that are on board, but V2X really opens up an opportunity where you can now be seeing the perception outputs of vehicles around you or even collecting like cloud infrastructure data. And this is, I think, really valuable because it gives you, you know, helps with some of these corner cases you see where you have blind spots or seeing around like a, you know, a building at an intersection. Um, and I think this is really exciting to improve safety. And, and the other benefit of that is you're not really adding any hardware costs to the vehicle. This is the really big thing. So I think you're seeing kind of frustration from the consumer that, oh, there's all this cool technology coming, but the cost of a car keeps increasing and increasing. So I think V2X is really a valuable because it can increase the scope of what you can accomplish and enhance the today's features while not kind of being an additional cost burden on the end consumer. There was a speaker, I think, earlier today, and um, we were talking about the speed of the technology and um, how do we interpret that. And we get caught up a lot on standards, and the technology is going to evolve. And the, the longer we wait, the longer it takes to catch up. So when we think about V to X, we call it C to V to X, like there's, everyone has a cell phone now, as you articulated, and so you literally have data in your hand, and we're not really using that to make anybody safer on the roads. The use cases, again, I go for the use, to, use cases, the technology shouldn't matter. What consumers are gonna care about, and it shouldn't just be for the premium consumer, it should be for every consumer. They're gonna be caring about, um, are they safe, and is, is their um, parent perhaps uh, having medical problems at the wheel. Is there a pedestrian coming around the corner that you're not going to see? Um, you're sitting at a stoplight, you're distracted. If you knew that the stoplight was going to turn green, you can also know that there's a pedestrian coming and you can make the choice whether to go or not to go. So I, I, I believe it's in the use cases and less about the technology, and they're absolutely re related because without one, you don't have the other. Yeah, thank you. So, so Vin, I've, I've got a question for you. Yes. Uh, from the government perspective, what do you see as the biggest impediment or challenge to automation and AI technologies realizing their potential in transportation? Yeah, I think it's the obvious answer of, um, you know, innovation is moving so fast. Sure. Uh, government as a process and the way things are perceived uh, from the outside especially, uh, it, you would feel like it's glacial. And, um, and for those of us who have worked inside the building can tell you, uh, you know, it's, it's hardly the case. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of necessary uh, structure in place to help us get to decision making. Um, that's why having those principles are really important, right? It gets everybody on the same page, gets everybody kind of going in the right direction, in the same direction. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a problem to solve for, to think, you know, what comes out of a Silicon Valley or wherever, you know, government's gonna be right up alongside. And that actually gives me a really good opportunity to put a plug in, which is uh, we'll be hiring my replacement as the chief AI officer uh, in the coming months. And so this is really an opportunity yeah. to, to recruit, I think, right? right? <laughs> to get the great minds in those seats uh, to be thinking about how, you know, you may want to become a part of public service and to help us understand, right, the world uh, yeah. a little bit better, and then vice versa. You know, I think that there is probably a, a, a sort of a culture shock, if you will, of, you know, innovators that when they come into government, right, they and, they say, <laughs> and they say, wait a second, I need five memos to do this thing? Like, what, what gives? Um, so I would have to say that that's probably the biggest impediment, but I can tell you from outside, inside, I've been all over, um, it, is, it is moving much quicker, uh, and, and it really does help having a uh, thoughtful, articulate, visionary secretary who's up there kind of explaining the why. Sure. 
Tara, what about you? What, what do you think is, you know, obviously not from a government perspective, but from an industry perspective, what do you think is the biggest obstacle or impediment to these technologies realizing their potential? <laughs> You'll be shocked to hear me say public engagement. We need to build public trust, and I think it's partly demystifying the technology, help people understand the testing and all of the work that goes into it. Every new technology, you know, the public is often slow to accept, and this is you know, this transformational first in a hundred years massive, you know, change to our transportation system and to help people understand, and I don't mean in a really in-depth way, we're not expecting people to be able to, you know, build an engine, but just understand how um, sensors work and how in the testing process it's gone into it. And then also, you know, again, engaging with the public to think through the potential benefits to safety, sustainability, equity, efficiency, all of these things, and just really having a dialogue with the public about what the future of transportation looks like. Yeah, Michelle, what, what would you say? I'm gonna pile onto that one because okay. I think, again, consumers, of course, want to save lives. I don't think anyone would say we don't wanna do this. I don't think they understand in vehicles which ones are better or not. I think we need to start with the, um, I have it right here, the safety ratings, um, so that consumers actually know and can make that choice at point of sale. Um, every major country, is adopting these um, ratings now, 2023, 2024, 2025, and the US is still NA. So I'm hoping somebody in this room can help us influence that because that is truly the way to get to a consumer's heart and mind and for um, the OEMs to start paying attention and make it affordable and, and available to everybody in every tier. Andrew. Yeah, I mean, Michelle, you hit it on the head, right? For, <laughs> For V2 X to be really valuable in, in some of these features we're talking about, you need market adoption, right? For the use cases to solve these use cases, you, can, you need a critical mass of vehicles that actually have the technology on board. Because as the adoption increases, the value and the use cases that you can solve increases as well. So I think it's really about getting the, the technology in the vehicle so that we can start building these kind of life-saving features and functions on top of them and leveraging them. So Michelle, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Uh, do you need anything? I mean, you sort of already answered this, but I'm asking you again, so you can down, you know, uh, 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 really make a finer point. What do you need from government mm -hmm. to be successful in this area? So at Harman, um, we were one of few who received some 5.9 licenses for waivers in order to start our V2X uh, trials. I think we've collected a lot of data. I think we understand um, a lot more about it. There's still a lot to learn. Um, so making sure we reserve frequencies, go faster. Um, it's gonna take multiple parties, not just one person is gonna solve this. It's gonna take an entire industry. And I believe in progress over perfection. Like let's, we've already started, let's get going a little bit faster and we can adapt and, and grow as we continue to go. All right, Andrew, what does Magna need from the government? Yeah, I mean, kind of complementing that message, it's similar approach of having the market adoption, but even investment, if you think of like smart infrastructure, right? So. Um, this is another way that you can kind of enhance V2X systems. It's not just vehicle to vehicle, but vehicle to inf infrastructure. So we show, you know, examples of, you know, smart cameras at intersections of high risk scenarios that can give you visibility into the blind spots that no vehicle sensor set can see. So I think this is an example of like investment in the infrastructure to help make these systems work better. Yeah. So Tara, in the autonomous vehicle space, you're, you're the companies that are part of PAVE. What, what, what do they need from government So I would love to see government involved in public education. Auto Innovators members are doing a phenomenal job of, of you know, working with PAVE and others on, and trying to educate folks. I always like to think of Click It or Ticket as a great example of industry and government coming together on a major safety issue and making massive changes in terms of behavior and, and, and you know, consumer knowledge. And I. I you know, obviously it's a different issue. Clicker to ticket is, is much, you know, more. There's one concrete action we're trying to, you know, teach people to do, and then there's an obvious, um, you know, ticket. Um, so I, I get that it's more complicated than that, but I think that's a good model of, of collaboration for an important safety goal. All right, Ben, we're going to flip the tables. I'm going to ask you, what do you need from industry, right? <laughs> uh, rather, rather than you just sitting here listening to everything we need from you, what is it that you are looking to industry to give to you all to help all of us be successful? Yeah, I, I think, like, look, we're at a time at the department where you know, research and curiosity and just the investments behind all of that, um, 
you know, look at what the infrastructure law has given us in terms of, you know, authorizing an ARPA I program. We never had something like that, right? Uh, to model after DARPA and DARPA E and stuff. Um, smart programs, uh, half a billion dollars, right? Um, you know, I was here when we did a smart city program for $15 million, right? So, you know, in terms of investment, in terms of putting kind of our money where our, our heart is, is, um, you know, I, I would say what we need are the insights. Um, I understand, for instance, I know that the, um, the ADS industry has been really going as fast as possible, trying to get as many miles to show, right, to, sh to make the safety case and to deploy where they can. Um, and, and still, when you add it up, and we hear, like, we've done 80 million miles, and you know that, you know, VMT is like 100 million miles a day in the country, you know, you start to say, you know, what we want to see is, is more of that uh, activity, more information that bears that out, more, uh, you know, I think a lot of those companies have come such a long way to develop use ca uh, safety cases and to actually come and show and share information. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's exactly what we need to see are, we, nobody in this industry wants a setback, uh, particularly the companies. Um, it, it, for, for us, we would love to have another tool in the toolbox that bends that, that trend I was talking about before. So get us your data, get us your information, use the SGO, the, the standing general order, right? Um, and, and engage with us. I'm not saying I wanna take a bunch of new meetings, but what I'm saying <laughs> is be a partner with us, right? Let's research together. Let's share information together, right? Nothing proprietary, um, so that we can both make the best, take the best steps forward, because we're both trying to do the same thing. All sides are trying to do the same thing, including education. Yeah. All right, so final question. I'd like to do uh, some friendly wagering to close this out. So based on where we are now, and where we are headed, and, and the barriers or obstacles that are out there, what is your prediction for when we will see these technologies in vehicles at a mass scale? Five years, 10 years, or longer? Andrew. I mean, if we focus on Vita X, because that's been a big topic, I, I would like to think that we'll see more mass adoption in the second half of the decade, probably closer to the 2028 to 2030. Um, and this will really scale from being initially kind of driver information Vita X based features, so um, to maybe in the in the 2030s to really being ADAS safety critical enhancement of the ADAS solutions using the VDAX signal, so. Okay, so Andrew's on the record five years, I heard from Andrew. <laughs> yeah. All right, Michelle. <laughs> I said I wasn't gonna be sarcastic up here, but I'm gonna go for two after we've had this amazing conversation. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna go faster. I think it, we all have it working, if you guys haven't been downstairs and look in the cars, like there's actual demos, there's OEMs that have launched it, it's available. You said mass, that's up to us. Yeah. Right? It's everyone in this room. There. And you. <laughs> so I'm going for two years. All right. Two, all right, two years. Tara. Okay. Well, I'm going to be the total buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, if we're talking true autonomy, I yes. think a lot longer. I mean, I think the ODDs will keep expanding, like both the number of deployments, the size of the deployments, the number of limitations on a car. But I don't, I think we are far, far, far away from like, level five cars driving mm. anywhere, everywhere. Yeah. All right, Ben, where are you coming down? Um, so around 2015, I participated in a, um, a 101 with a group at Transportation Camp, which if you know what Transportation Camp is, it sort of like feeds off of TRB, Transportation Research Board. And, um, and we all jammed into a room and everybody gave their best estimates on kind of around that time. Is it gonna be three years, five years? And I would have to say, everybody said within like eight years. And then there was somebody with a rideshare company who at the very end put up his hand and said, that's all kind of cute and fine. But you know, we are a rideshare and we've been in the market for 15 years and we have like 10% penetration market right. penetration. And it was a reality check for all of us at that point in time. Um, but if I had to say, you know, I, I think Tara, you're right to think full adoption is gonna take a lot longer, right? As we, as we kind of harvest this information and make determinations and state and local governments are doing their part. Um, so it's gonna take a lot longer, but I hope by 2035, because I think that's when my kid can get his permit. Perfect. So. All right, Vin, Tara, Michelle, Andrew, uh, thanks for being here today. I wanted to finish with, a, there's a quote, if, if, if uh, you ever come to my office, there's a, a quote I have on the wall from 
uh, Wilbur Wright, one of the Wright brothers. And it's one of my favorite quotes ever, and it's what guides me in the transportation space. So I wanted to close with this. He is reportedly said in, in 1908, it is not really necessary to look too far into the future. We see enough already to be certain it will be magnificent. Only let us hurry and open the roads. So that's how I'm feeling about what we're talking about today. So let's uh, open those roads and get this out there. Thank you guys. Thank you very much.